Okay, so okay, thank you. So um, <clears throat> today we'll discuss uh, real time stuff. So real time ADS CFT. But uh, I will start start with uh, a brief uh, review of what you did yesterday of Euclidean ADS CFT. Now uh, using a scale field as an example. It will be not as detailed as yesterday. And then we'll discuss uh, kind of new issues when uh, we are in uh, kind of Lorentzian signature. Then we'll have a little bit of um, interlude into kind of quantum field theory. Uh, maybe I should better say non equilibrium. Kind of field theory, and then uh, I will present uh, real real time prescription. And then we'll discuss examples. Okay, so that's the plan. Okay, so let's. Uh, Brief review what we discussed uh, the last two lectures. So again, Euclidean ADS. So the main prescription is that the partition function as boundary as a function of boundary conditions. So uh, here we're discussing the law energy regime on the gravity side. So this is gravity. So we have a cathedral where the field phi has some boundary conditions phi naught. And uh, we have an action, which is again, a function of the, uh, the field phi. And then ADS CFT says that uh, this is the expectation value minus. The CFT, the, the, the expectation value of correlators of the operator O where the boundary the boundary condition here acts as a source. And then uh, we've seen that uh, if we now, so then at um, a three level, this becomes the on shell value of the action as a function of the boundary conditions. And this is the generating function of, of connected graphs. And then we discussed that if you now vary the on shell value of the action, then we get a filter equation term, which vanishes because we're on shell. And then we get a boundary term. where this object here is a radial canonical momentum. And I'm, I'm putting a little R here because in a moment, we're gonna also see kind of usual time canoni canonical momentum. So then from here, we see that uh, the, the variation of the on shell action with respect to the field is this radial canonical momentum which as we discuss in detail, this diverges. And uh, one can use uh, an expansion in eigenfunctions of the dilatation operator to extract the normalized piece. So this object here has the following decomposition. Okay, so, um, and again, uh, as yesterday, this objects, uh, this objects here are eigenfunctions of the dilatation operator. So delta T of pi n is minus n pi n. 
so this object here and this one, all of them diverge, but this guy here is finite. Now this, uh, when the dimension Delta is D over two plus an integer, and it's related to conformal anomalies associated with uh, scalar operators. Well, in two point functions, for higher point functions, there are additional anomalies that could appear, uh, which do not necessarily have uh, this specific dimension. Um, okay, so now the normalization procedure at the end of the day, after we add counter terms, amounts to essentially extracting that piece over here. So now, the normalization accounts to, so if we have an operator of dimension Delta, then the result is exactly the piece that has the piece of canonical momentum with has dimension delta. And if we now write the, the field in Pfeffermann Graham coordinates, so in Pfeffermann Graham coordinates, the asymptotic solution of the scalar field takes the following form. So we have d to d minus delta, we have phi naught. Oops. Well, again, this appears only when delta. Okay, let me. Sorry, it's z to the two d minus delta. It's not. Yes. Yeah, so it is but it's z multiplied. to the delta or to the multiply with this, right? This is an overall factor. So if I put them together, it would be z to the delta. Uh, yeah, that doesn't add up. Ah, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, you're right. It's two delta minus d. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's what I thought. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Correct. Two delta minus d. Um, again, that's this is only present this guy only when uh, this combination is an integer. And uh, as before, this is the source. And now this guy here is the one associated with the VEV. And the precise formula is that O delta is two delta minus D and phi to delta minus d. Okay, that's the general, this aesthetic analysis. Now, if you wanna do uh, correlators, so for the two point function, which we also discussed yesterday. So if I want to compute OX for delta at zero, Actually, let me put X and Y just to make it slightly more clear. So that would be two delta minus D. And then we need the variation of this coefficient with respect to the source. Now to obtain this, we need so we need the solution of the linearized equations. Now, this is the first part, which will be different in a moment. Now in Euclidean ADS,
given sources. There is a unique regular solution. So now, if you, if you solve the linearized equations, then you just extract the regular solution, and then you put it here, and then you play in the correlator. Now, in a longer version of this course, I would have given you now an explicit example where you actually see how you extract it and get the right form of correlator. But for today, we're going to leave it here and then move to uh, Lorentzian. Ah, let me add one more thing. So if you want to compute um, endpoint functions, then the procedure is the same. Then you need the n minus 1 order equations, which you solve, and then you find the uh, Sorry, this is not very clear down here. And so if you want three-point functions, you need the second order perturbation around the vacuum. If you want four-point functions, then you get third variation and so on. And then you need to extract the, uh, the regular solution and then plug it into the corresponding equation here and extract the answer. Okay, so any questions on the Euclidean part before I move on to Lorentzian stuff? And if you do follow this, this procedure, this kind of derives for you, in a sense, the Witten diagrams that people often use in the literature. Uh, but this also allows you to, uh, I mean, the expressions that people often write are, are only hold at non-coincident points. This allows you to also understand what happens at coincident points. Okay, good. So now let's move to Lorentzian. Well, let's try to generalize, in a sense, do the straightforward generalization to, as far as we can go. So now we're going to have a path integral. So this path integral, so now we have, this is Lorentzian, so we have an I here. We still have a conformal boundary, so I want to discuss the geometry of ADS, which is a Lorentzian ADS, so phi. We still have some behavior from a boundary, but now in the, there's also a time like so the time direction also has boundaries, and we need to understand how it behaves at future and past infinity, and let's call this phi plus minus. So kind of the first question is what is the meaning? of phi plus minus. Now, secondly, so again, following again the same procedure, now we can go to three level and then do the variation. So now the variation of the on-shell action, again, it's gonna be a bulk term, which is filled the question, so vanishes on shell. And then like in the Euclidean case, it would be, this at the radial boundary. And that we understand, this is the radial canonical momentum, which is related to the value of the operator. And now we have also boundaries in the other directions. Well, now this is the usual momentum, canonical momentum. Uh, so then again, what is the meaning of this? So if we have, if we want to understand Lorentzian issues, we have to address these issues. Uh, so this is the second part. And then the third part, now if one looks at the 
linearize, suppose you want to do two point functions. Let's first start with two point functions. As with yourself, to compute two point functions, you need to solve linearized equations. Now, the linearized equations do not admit a unique solution. As you will see later on, I will discuss an example. So then what do we do? Which one do we select? Okay. <clears throat> Any questions on those so far? Okay, so now let's now move to the quantum filter side. Well, so I want to have a, uh, so in real time quantum field theory. There are more than one type of of, uh, of correlator. So we can have time-ordered correlators. We can have uh, retarded advanced whitening functions. Which I, I will I will define this in a bit more detail in a minute. So let's first review how to actually compute those. Uh, and then the natural question would be, we know in quantum filter how to compute them and I will review it in a minute. So if I has a dual version of the quantum field theory, there should be a prescription that uh, will compute all of those independently without having to go back to the quantum field theory. I mean, quite, quite often once, you know, does a gravity computation and then uses kind of analytic continuations that are known from the quantum field theory. That's a kind of a, a mixed bag. So if, if, if holography is really an, an independent definition of the theory, it has to be a way to compute all of those by just, without referring back to the quantum field theory. Um, and we will see we can do that. Uh, so let's first start with uh, <clears throat> the usual time order. So usually, or in a textbook, quantum field theory computes uh, vacuum time order products. And actually computes them in a kind of sort of in state, out state. Like, like like a scattering scattering amplitude context. So you prepare some in state, then you search some local operators, you look at time order, and then uh, you have some out state. And uh, one way to compute this with path integrals. So now uh, if you have, uh, let me see how should I, yeah, so, so this expression here, I can also write it as follows. I can integrate over psi plus psi minus. So I can introduce in between kind of intermediate states. Certain that sometime T. Uh, and then you have another state at the minus time minus t, and then 
sa minus minus t. Uh, yes. Still don't have enough space. Now this guy is here. This and that, these are kind of vacuum wave functions. And the object in between, this one object, this can be, can be computed by path integral uh, while you impose uh, boundary conditions in a time direction. So if you have, so the object, um, psi plus, oh. Well, this is computed if you do a path integral over all fields, where you now impose that uh, the field phi becomes uh, at x plus minus t is equal to psi plus minus at x. And then <clears throat> you, you do the, the, the the usual path integral. <clears throat> so that what, so this path integral or the path integral, oh, sorry, I didn't put the insertions. Um, So the path integral, if you do the insertions, automatically produces time ordered. And the boundary conditions here specify the initial and the final state. Of course, we're not really interested in this object. We interested. So this guys over here, you can obtain by, um, by using an Euclidean path integral. So now let's go back to the wave functions. So the vacuum. So the vacuum <clears throat> wave functions, let's say uh, kind of phi, uh, how you call it? Psi minus comma t. This you can obtain by taking the limit as beta goes to infinity of any state psi, and then you act. So when you when you generate this, so this is in Euclidean path integral because you have a minus here. So, uh, so when you take to infinity, this projects to the vacuum state and generates this wave function and there is a similar constant together this object over here can be generated if you instead of having the usual time direction you introduce a complex introduce a complex uh, a complex time and then you introduce a contour in complex time. So this is the real part, this is the imaginary part. And then uh, let's say this is minus T. 
and this is plus t. So now if you do the path integral or you replace time with this contour over here, so the path integral with this contour produces um, kind of the vacuum to vacuum correlators. Well, the operators are inserted at some points along this contour, and then this Euclidean pieces kind of produce the, the vacuum wave functions. Okay. Um, now, in general, so that's in a sense what we do mostly in, 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 in quantum field theory courses. But if you have a system which is out of equilibrium, in general, you're not interested in in out. Uh, in, in out amplitudes, rather you're interested in 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 amplitudes. So in this case, you're interested in having some state alpha at some time t, and then uh, you may have insertion, some insertions of operators. And then you want to compute the expectation value of these operators in the same state at the same time. So this is typically, for instance, if you do cosmology, this, this is a type of expressions you would be interested in because again, you want to know what is the expectation value of fields now or at some time in the future. You don't want to know, you're not interested in kind of something prepared in the, in the infinite past and then uh, something happened in the infinite future. You want to know when you do measurements locally now, you want to know what, what would be what would be the results. So usually, <clears throat> so to, to compute this, yeah, the formalism goes back to uh, Swinging and Keldish. So this in in formalism sometimes is also called Swinger. Keltish and uh, goes back to the 60s, beginning of the 1960s. So instead of considering this type of contour, you are considering an Enian contour. Again, you complexify time. Um, so now you generate state alpha, you go forward in time, up some time. Now that state, if you have a conforma fill theory, now you can use an operator state correspondence to kind of, so in CFT, well, it's more general in quantum field theory, but in CFT is, is, is cleanest because you have a clean operator state correspondence. So any state can be generated by an operator acting on the vacuum. So then you can generate this by acting with a vacuum and having Euclidean path integrals. And you can also have uh, kind of an in informalism with vacuum states. So, um, vacuum to vacuum correlators. Can also be computed using uh, an in in contour. So basically, what you do is you go back forward in time, you go backward in time, and then you insert infinite segments. So if you use that contour, that would generate uh, again vacuum to vacuum correlators. So now the prescription is so the way the uh, the, the path integral is 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 generalized is that when you have 
for this business over here. So you take the, so we had I over S in the exponent of the path integral, and you replace this with, so now you, you want to be able to compute correlators where you may insert the, uh, you may insert the, uh, the operators either in the upper or in the lower contour. And in general, so let's call this upper contour one and the lower one two. So in general, you introduce different sources at the different parts. So this is, you have a source in the, in the first one that couples to an operator. I have another source in the second one that also couples to the operator. And the relative, the difference in the sign is because one contour goes forward in time. Actually, I should have that. I should have had them on the opposite way. So this, uh, this contour goes forward in time, and this contour goes backwards in time, and that's why one has different signs in front of the sources. Okay, so now let's uh, translate how, how, uh, what sort of correlators we do if we do a path integral with, with this time of contour. So again, path integral, if you do a path integral, path integral always produces time ordered. And if you do, if the time contour is complex, then the path integral would, would produce a time order along the complex contour. So if I have, this contour here, and I put both operators at the upper part, and then and if I do the path integral, then uh, this, would produce, this would compute for me the time ordered product, like the usual in out, now, if I, so now I'm going to have, in all cases, I will insert them in the points x1 and x2, but in one case, it would be in the upper part, in the other case, so I'm going to go through all different cases. So again, this is x1 and this is x2. So this, if I now do the path integral with this correlator, now we'll denote with the tau time ordered product along the complex conjure. So again, we have O1 and O2. But now the, again, time order, it's along the contour. So this means that this operator is always before that one. So that would be, there's no time ordering. So this always comes first and this always comes second uh, yeah let me also put here so this was just indicate this is make it more clear this was at the top and this is at the bottom let me also call them put put in different operators one and two, one and two. So this is an operator with no specific ordering. This is called a Weichmann function. So now let's go through the other two cases. So now I will put this here and this there. Again, that's X1 and X2. So this is a time ordering. So now the one is in the second part. It's position at X1. And the two is in the upper part and it's position at X2. And this is again time ordering along the contour. 
which means that this this term comes before that one. So now this is the same as O2 with X2, one. And again, no specific ordering. So this is again a white one. And finally, we have the case where um, we have both of them at the bottom. Okay, so now that will be time ordering. So we have the first one, it's in the second one, and it's text one. And the second one is also in the second path, text two. Now this one, since we follow the contour in this, oops, we follow the contour like here. This is gonna come always. So now over here, we have, again, pathetic produced time ordered, but now time goes backwards. So this produces a nine on the time ordering, which is usually denoted by star of the two operators. Okay, so that's how you can compute, uh, you know, the different type of correlators in uh, using kind of art of equilibrium methods. So, uh, but when I review the type of correlators, I also discussed that we have uh, kind of advanced and retarded. So now let me tell you also how to compute uh, the retarded one. So, and there is a similar construction for advanced. So for retarded, what we do is uh, we put the same source. Well, first of all, uh, let me give you, before I tell you how to, oops, how to compute it, let, let me give you what it is. So the target correlator So this is a causal propagator. So it has a theta function. There is a conventional minus i, and then you have the commutator of the two operators. Now, uh, with uh, you know, a couple of lines shows that this is the same as minus i, and then we have the um, time ordering of how x or x prime, and then we have plus i, the Whiteman function, of x or x prime. And we can get this by just using the definition of time order in terms of theta functions and then comparing with the previous line. Okay, so now we want to compute this um, using an in informalism. So in in informalism, then uh, what you do is you equate the sources on the two sides. And then uh, you differentiate the generating function of, of an operator position at the, at, the, at the top site. And then, uh, so now there will be, so now from here, again, by using the definitions, so this is delta, delta J. And then I have the path integral of O1 of X prime. And then I have I J O minus I J O. 
and it is the same J because I put the same source on both sides. So when I differentiate this one, then both operators are going to be on the top. And then we saw that when both operators on the top, we get the time ordering. So this gives I and then time ordering X prime OX. And then when I differentiate the second one, this one, and one is at the top side and one is at the bottom. So top and bottom gives Whiteman. And then uh, you, you can see uh, by comparing this line to that line that that exactly produces minus the retarded correlator. Okay, so that's how we compute retarded correlators in uh, with with real time. Uh, <clears throat> finally, if we want thermal or you know some general state, but let's say thermal, so thermal. And the contour you need to consider is you go forward in time, you go backwards, and then you go down, and then you identify this point with that point. And the distance you go down is equal to the uh, to beta. <clears throat> and then if you want to compute correlators, then again four times of correlators because you can put either bottom here, one on top, one on one here and one there and so on. So there are again four different types or different types of correlators. And this formalism also has uh, so some general uh, features. Some, uh, So general property. So the results do not depend if you deform the contour. So uh, results are independent of deformation contour, provided two things hold. You do not cross any operator insertions. And secondly, the contour can go down, but cannot go up. Uh, only it must downwards. You're allowed to move horizontally, but you're not you're not allowed to move the contour up. Okay, so whatever prescription we have in the bulk, it has to respect all of this. One should be able to compute all of this type of correlators in a natural way. Okay, so now <clears throat> that finishes the interlude. So any questions before I tell you how to what is the prescription that does this? The, the operator insertions need to stay fixed in the complex plane, right? Yeah, so the operator uh, insertions are fixed. So you, you decide what you insert and then you compute the correlator. Okay. Okay, any other? So, 
I mean, this is what usually people call zigzag symmetry, right? That you can add spike and go, go back and cancel things. Well, I mean, zigzag uh, more specifically was uh, was used by Polyakov in the context of uh, uh, Wilson loops, um, but uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure it was called zigzag in this in the context of uh, of this. But I mean, for instance, okay, uh, uh, just just to give you an example, because I'm gonna if I have time, um, we we're gonna see here. So an equivalent contour to this, to, I'll give you two equivalent forms. And uh, they're the, the both kind of used in the literature. Uh, so one is to go down by beta over two, and then to return, and then go here. So that's a condor that one often finds in the kind of condensed matter literature. And uh, a condor that uh, I will discuss uh, towards the end is instead of giving this, you can have go here, go back down by beta over two, and then go to the left, and then go back, and then another beta over two. So this is, in a sense, the uh, th this is the contour that one can use to, to compute thermocorrelators using, uh, for instance, BTZ black hole. That's the most natural contour that one gets um, in, in holography. Uh, but any, I mean, all of this are equivalent because again, you can, as long as they're not equivalent only if I insert operators, if I insert an operator here and an operator there, then of course I cannot shrink this back here. But if my interest is in computing this type of correlators, then I can have them there. And then what happens to the rest of the condor is not so relevant. So this type of condor would be, this is the most straightforward condor in, in, in holography because that's the most straightforward, that's the most straightforward way to solve the, the, the conditions that I will discuss in a moment. Um, but again, this deformation of the condor. So yesterday somebody asked me about horizons, black holes and horizons and so on. And I said, Things do not depend very much on whether you go inside or not and how far you go. And uh, the origin of that statement is that, you know, how far you go inside the black hole horizon is correlated with this is how far you extend them or not. So provided an operator, there's no operator uh, insertion, then the results are completely equivalent. But that uh, we can uh, see again uh, towards the end. Okay, Danny. Okay, so now um, real time ADS CFT. Well, it's fairly simple to um, to state. So basically, given a contour, you associate a corresponding bulk space time. So given a shrinker character's contour, we associate about space time with the following properties. So horizontal parts of the contour correspond to Lorentzian bulk, and then vertical parts corresponds to Euclidean bulk, bulk. And then you have to say what you do when they meet. And then we have uh, matching conditions the corners. So um, just to illustrate, I will discuss the matching conditions in a minute, but just to illustrate the, the first two parts. So 
we discuss the first contour we discuss was the in out. So this would be contour. So now corresponding to this. So I have a Lorentzian ADS corresponding to this piece. And then we set this are Euclidean pieces and we have Euclidean pieces. Now again, Lorentzian ADS is a cylinder. Euclidean ADS is a sphere. And here we need, in a sense, half of a sphere. Maybe you can put them with different color here and there. So this is Euclidean ADS. Then if you have uh, kind of an in, in condur like this one that we discussed earlier. So that would be, again, we have this Euclidean parts. Then this is followed by a Lorentzian piece. This is Euclidean, Lorentzian. And then you glue another Lorentzian piece to it or time should go the other way around. And then you close this with a Euclidean cup. And we need, I need to tell you, so here, in a sense, I gave you the first two things. I need to tell you, what do you do when you're here? What, what happens to the bulk fields when you reach the surfaces? Um, so these are the matching conditions. And the matching conditions are that uh, the fields are continuous. And the canonical momenta, I mean the user canonical momenta, the time canonical momenta, are continuous along the path. So this means in particular, so if you have, uh, let's say if you have a corner, so, so the momentum on one side is equal to the momentum on the other up to a factor which I call eta. So if you have kind of a corner like this, have Euclidean to Lorentzian, then, uh, this factor is minus i. And if you have 180 degrees turn, we get from Lorentzian to Lorentzian, then this factor is minus one. And <clears throat> you can derive this using similar, um, similar methods as, as with kind of Israel matching conditions. If we had more time, I would have probably explained this if we, no, I don't follow. Well, let's see if we have time, I can come back and explain it in more detail. So now what I would do next is I, I will illustrate this using uh, using an example. So any questions? Oh, sorry, Con continuous here means that there can be jumps when it is equal minus one, for example. So the, the canonical momentum, when you kind of go from here to there, you should satisfy this condition with specific with this with a sign. So when I go from here to there, the canonical momentum will satisfy that condition with a minus i. And you will see in a minute how it's implemented. So in a sense, when I have my bulk fields, let's say take this one here, where it kind of it's this corner, right? So when I go, so I have a canonical momentum from this side and one from that side which is localized on that surface. And then uh, the two, they should differ by a factor of minus i. On the other hand, if I, I, if I look at this surface here, when I glued, so when I come from here, we have one canonical momentum, one from there, and the two, they should differ by, by minus.
So depending on which corner you are, you have a slightly different factor, plus minus i, plus minus one. Well, plus one is almost, it's, it's never because the contour either turns, either it's either 90 degree or 180 degree. So it's either uh, plus minus i or minus one. Okay. Are, are the solutions generically complex? The solutions, uh, for, the, for the example, we're gonna discuss now the solutions are real, but I would say in the generic case, the solution should be what is dictated by these conditions. There should be kind of a real slice in complex on complex plane, but that real slice may not be what you kind of naively think it would be. Uh, for instance, if you would do a, a rotating BTZ black hole, when you uh, when you glue them, when you do this this gluing procedure, then uh, the Euclidean piece is not real in in the, in, the, in the sense in in, in the in a sense, we usually have the Euclidean solutions because the angular right. momentum is not continued in in, 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 this, in this procedure. It has kind of a natural analytic natural reality properties that follow from from the from the CFT. So this is a kind of a CFT argument that tells you what is the reality conditions you need in the bulk. I see. Okay. Uh, so in a sense, uh, you know, what we're having here, it, it is a generalization of, uh, of Hartle Hawking. But now this comes automatically with prescribed reality conditions that follow from CFT rather than try to kind of guess them which should be the right ones based on kind of bulk arguments. Okay, so. <clears throat> So the example I'm going to do a two-point function <clears throat> of a scalar field. Two-point function of scalar field in uh, ADS3. That's technically the easiest, but one can do other ones. Uh, so, and in the papers we discuss uh, a large number of examples in different different dimensions, different contexts. So the bulk action, since I'm only gonna do a two-point function, it's only the quadratic part, which is did it. So we have this one, and then the dimension, I will take the dimension to be one plus L, where L is an integer. Again, this is uh, this is the use. This is the typical dimensions that one gets in uh, realistic top-down examples. Uh, so then, as we review early on, then uh, and since everything that we did for holographic minimization goes through in this context as well, this is about in a sense the radial direction. So here, what is new is how you treat the the time direction. Uh, then the expectation value of the dual operator would be, again, the radial canonical momentum um, where you extract, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, they should have been here. Uh, this is one plus L and this is two L by to L using the convention I had earlier. And now the expansion of the bulk field near the boundary. So I here would call Z, now we use Feffman gram coordinates. So it starts with one minus lambda, and then you have phi naught. Then you have Z to, to L, and then phi to L. This is a case where there is a log because this is a case where the dimension is d over two. So this is d over two plus an integer, since d equals two in this case. 
Shall we have copies? So now to, uh, to obtain the correlator, we need an exact solution. And this problem has a general solution. So then the general solution, so we have two isometries. So we have, because we have time isometry and isometry over the, the, uh, the, the boundary direction. So we could expand, we could, in this is Fourier, expand into those. And then we're left with a radial function, which depends on omega, plus minus k and the radial direction. Um, yeah, so maybe I should put it here. So to solve the equation, it is simplest to work in global coordinates. So the R that appears here is the one, <clears throat> this is the, 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 um, the global, the form of the global coordinates I gave you yesterday. And yesterday, I also gave you how to go from uh, uh, from the R variable to the Z variable. <clears throat> so if you use these coordinates and then uh, factor out kind of the, the, the directions that have isometries, you get a radial function. And then uh, this radial function, the solution of the radial function You can choose some normalization coefficient in a way that I will describe in a minute. And then here we have a hypergeometric function. With coefficients a, b, and c that have okay, given the paper, but then one can choose the um, the coefficients such that uh, this is the following expansion, asymptotic expansion. So it starts with one, and this is precisely where the source is. So we normalize the source to be one, or more properly, it's. Uh, you just given by this Fourier coefficients with unit coefficients. And in a moment, we'll use that to write the general solution with general source. Um, Okay, and now um, this piece here is where the web is. And uh, this, or in other words, this A coefficient is, is the Kofferman anomaly. Now, in Euclidean signature, okay, there is a version of this equation in Euclidean signature, and that would be the end of the story. But in, uh, in Lorentzian signature, there exist additional solutions which are only normalizable. They, they go to zero at infinity. There are also solutions normalizable solutions. that exists for special 
for specific values or frequencies. So this is specified by an integer n. Where this is a natural number. And so now we have solved the equation in complete generality. So we know all solutions. We know solutions that uh, behave like, uh, like source. And we know there are additional solutions that fall off at infinity. So now we can write down the general solution. <clears throat> so the general solution that depends on T phi and R. Well, we have some. Uh, Modization factor, which is not important. Then we have an integral over omega and integral over t hat and phi hat. So what I wrote so far, what this, so you can see here what this factor does. So this behaves asymptotically as an one. So now this integral it just produce a source, which is uh, you know phi naught of uh, t and x, t, t and phi. So this is just the Fourier transform of that source. But then in addition to these terms, have additional terms, which are the normalizable solutions. where this specific piece over here can yeah, to this function f I describe over here. And it's basically given by a condur integral over circles, which are centered at the normalizable frequencies of the same function. So this function here, this product contains poles at the normalizable frequencies given here. And here, so we have the general solution and we added to this a general linear combination of all the normalizable solutions. So all of the solutions as you go to infinity fall off to zero and therefore does not affect the fact that, uh, you know, we're given a source we have this arbitrariness. So this, this illustrates what I said earlier. So in, in the Lorentzian context, if you give sources, you do not have a unique solution. We have an infinite number of solutions because you cannot arbitrary number of uh, linear combination of these normalizable modes. You have five more now, minutes, uh, Costas, just to make sure. Okay, okay. So um, for minutes, yeah, we will, um, it will be a little bit quick. Uh, but precisely because we have this, 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 this functions f have poles, this means I have to be careful of what do we mean with these integrals here. So in general, one needs to try because if I do an integral over the real line, this would hit the poles at these positions and these expressions would be infinite. So here we need to specify a contour C so if I again, if I now 
put the complex frequency plane. So I have a pulse in, on, on the real axis. And we need to, to in, in order to define the integral, we need to define a contour. So suppose I chose some contour, let's say this one. Then I can say, how does your result depend on the choice of the contour? Now, if we start deforming the contour, I can uh, sort of start deforming it, kind of, sorry, um, make it like this. Then the difference of the contours would be an, an integral over kind of this pulse over here. But the integrals over the pulse gives normalizable modes. So by choosing by, by choosing different contours, the only thing that that happens is that you change these coefficients new. So you can uh, you may as well start with some given contour and understand the dependence of the answer on uh, on, on 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 the coefficients c n. Now to fix these coefficients, now you can do kind of an in out computation. Uh, yeah, uh, four minutes. <laughs> um, so this was the Lorentzian solution. So for you know, uh, we also need the Euclidean solutions. Now in the Euclidean solution, if you do it really on the entire U Euclidean ADS, if you have zero sources, then the full solution is zero. But if one does it of kind of a half of ADS, there are solutions that have zero source up here, which are non zero because the singularity sits on the other on the other half. And I can write down the general solutions. So the general solution of the Euclidean one. is given by an expression that also involves the normalizable fre the frequencies. And then you can impose matching conditions. In this case, the Lorentzian field, you can impose it at t equals zero, should match the Euclidean solution. And then the canonical momenta, which are just derivatives, since it's a kind of 90 degree match, it should differ by, by minus i. And you can solve those for both corners. So, and then the result is that uh, if my starting point is the blue contour, so if I use this as a reference contour, then you find that the matching conditions tells you that all the coefficients of the normalizable modes are exactly equal to zero, and the coefficients that appear in the Euclidean pieces are related to the value of the source at the normalizable frequencies via this formula. So now you completely, now we have a unique solution, and the contour that we have is actually, in a sense, the Feynman contour. And then you can uh, complete the computation. And then you find, so, you, so I inserted, so this was an in-out contour, so I expected the time or the product. And that's exactly what you find. So in this case, 
this, this is really in derivation is not uh, is not an input so you find the right i epsilons coming out of it so that's the answer and then uh, you can do different condors for instance if you want to compute um, a Whiteman function, you can use uh, the Condurus that gives you a Whiteman function, and then you can follow through the same procedure. You solve the, you, know, you find the solution in each of the pieces. You use the matching conditions. You solve the matching conditions, and you find the answer. Again, the answer is unique because the solution is unique after you impose matching conditions, and then you get exactly the correct expected uh, I epsilon prescription for a Whiteman function. If you want to compute a, a retarded, Again, you use the, uh, the, the, the Condura I showed you earlier, and you do the computation, and you quickly find the retarded, and so on. And if you want to do thermal, you do the same thing with, uh, you use the, the, the same procedure now using uh, what well, the bulk space time is a black hole space time. And I'm probably out of time. Yes, uh, any questions in the audience? You killed him. <laughs> okay, um, let's thank Costas. So with black holes, it gets, you know, the, 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 the usual story was that you just do retarded infalling. Uh, yeah, but that, this was a prescription, right? That, that we can now derive. Like we have derived it 10 years ago. So using uh, this, this idea you can you can derive that you need uh, for retarded you use in falling so that follows from the uh, from this condors it's not it's not a prescription it's not an independent right. uh, piece it just follows from it yeah but that's the one that people use in numerics yeah 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 sure, <laughs> sure. yes no i mean you know again uh, with prescriptions the, 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 the issue is if, if you give a prescription, okay, what is its validity and what is the justification? And I think for the original uh, Sean Starinet's uh, kind of prescription, okay, the, the justification was more like that it was natural. And I think what we have works completely generally. And uh, it has all the right features. Okay, we didn't have time to discuss, but you know, has uh, you know the general property. If you deform the condor, you get uh, the answer is, is the same. Again, you, you can derive I epsilon, so thermal correlators. Uh, and now, if you specifically want to apply this to a kind of uh, you know the, the region outside the horizon and see what boundary conditions you would need at the horizon, that follows. From, from this general uh, discussion. Um, also, the, the original discussion did not discuss what happens at plus minus infinity, where, and again, the answers are infinite and so on. Uh, but here we have, everything is under control. Right. Okay, um, anyone else? Um, so along with these, uh, correlators that you mentioned there's also maybe it's uh, one of these the aut out of time autocorrelation yeah yeah you can do that yeah sorry you, go on you can, you can do those as well it's uh, I don't think they have been computed using the formalism but it's completely natural and this can realize any contour you just choose your contour you choose where to put your correlators and you follow your nose Thank you. Anyone else? If not, let's let's thank Costas one more time. <laughs>